All right, Alex, I'm very, very excited to talk to you. I'm very excited to have you here. I want to get into your transition from commercial design and working for Win into developing your own studio. But before we get into all that, I want to know what was the moment that you knew design was for you? Well, Courtney, first of all, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you for, for taking the time to, to have this conversation. I think design has always been in my blood one way or another. I mean, I was taking art lessons from first grade onward as an extracurricular kind of thing, and I've never been able to stop drawing. I, I actually came to interior design by way of architecture, which I also kind of found by accident. I used to, I was, I was obsessed with castles and then with, with Baroque palaces kind of from middle school through high school. And I was you know, obsessed with Legos at the same time. And uh, as I was, I think it was in eighth grade, one of my teachers called me out for drawing floor plans in my notebook during a, during a class. Cause every time we would read like the good earth, for example, I remember drawing a, a more kind of a more Chinese style house and other things like that. I mean, based on whatever we were reading, it influenced what I was drawing. And they suggested that I get into architecture and it hadn't even occurred to me that I could do that, that I could translate my, my, my love and my passion into something professional. So that became the focus. And um, I went to, I mean, in high school, I was focused on that. And then, and then I went to have my degree ultimately in architecture from Cornell University. Uh, and I was always the sort of Renaissance kid at a very modernist school. Cornell is a, is a very, uh, it's Le Corbusier and Musandero and then and Cole House at the time. And all, all of their architecture is, I mean, I had to learn about how to take modernity basically, and then infuse what I call a bit more of soul from, from history back into it. So uh, it's, I think I was always interested in the interior experience of palaces and buildings in general, but it wasn't until I came to win that I ended up in interior design. And that happened, I know this is a long-winded explanation, but right. <laughs> uh, I was, while studying architecture, working on my thesis, which was, um, it was basically, uh, it was, I wanted to design a, a home for the Secretary of State as a diplomatic tool to use architecture as a manipulative instrument on guests. So whatever space you walked through and whatever sequence it could imply the, the meaning and the purpose. And I visited friends in LA and the hangover happened to come on TV and we we're like, what the hell, let's go to Vegas. And uh, it was my first time there and I'd always looked down on it, first of all. And um, <laughs> like academically. And uh, and <laughs> I realized that what, that what was happening it, what they were doing in casinos was exactly what my thesis was about, just through a different lens. And we went to Excess, a nightclub at, at Encore that that my mentor and and eventually my my boss, Roger Thomas, had designed with with Wind Design and Development. And they hit the nail on the head. You you walk up these the staircase that's designed specifically to make you descend into the room with this sense of wealth and power and 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 you feel sexy and and you 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 you're you're you abandon your wallet and your morals and you fall into the trap. And I, I certainly did. <laughs> and, and I wanted to learn from them. So after I graduated, I ended up moving to Las Vegas to work for when I thought it'd be a two year stint, but I thought I'd work for architecture and uh, their department didn't really look at my portfolio, but Roger found it and, uh, and made this wonderful position for me. And I was able to grow with the company and I was there ultimately for almost 10 years. Moving from a decade at when into founding your own studio. How has your process, aesthetic, your business, what's changed the most? When I started this, this separate business, and we've been open for, for four years now, a little bit over, I thought the focus would be more residential. And we had been doing some residential projects for ownership of the hotel. And we did things like you know mega villas and yachts and projects like that. And that was sort of my focus. And we just started to trickle a couple of hospitality projects. And then more recently in the past year and a half, we're really, we're kind of evenly split. But what I have observed is that uh, residential, residential projects operate very differently than hospitality ones. And as much as we want to convince the client that the right way to do a project is following a certain pathway, most of our clients are um, are high net worth and have made their own fortunes in a lot of cases. And they do that through their own brilliance and their own way of figuring things out for themselves. And so they they all have a sense of how things might be able to be done more efficiently or better outside of our known system. So every single project is a learning curve. We We love it. We adore our clients. We adore our projects with them, but they're all totally different. So how do we manage it? Um, with patience. <laughs> I, you know, it's, 
it, it's uh, it, we're 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 still trying to figure it out. To be honest, um, I think that we're just over the hump with some of our first residential projects having completed. We've learned where we can tweak and tailor and and adjust and and we also want to try to steer them towards a more residential, a more excuse me, more commercial path in terms of decision making and processing. And what about the aesthetics? Something that I've really been aware of recently is how many residential consumers want their homes to look like hotels they've stayed in. And I'm sure that's a request you get often and it probably comes kind of natural to you. So tell me about what, what that's like. Are you seeing more of that or has it always been like that for you? First of all, it's always been like that for us. And we've working, Wynn always saw our hotel properties as very large homes. We wanted the guests to feel that that much at home. And obviously they're grandiose, but the the conveniences and the, uh, the, 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 the way that guests were asked to approach various spaces is, is meant to feel like it's their home, mm -hmm. a very large palatial residence. So we do, we, and we were always also trained to think like a guest, right? To make things really intuitive, really easy so that you're not trying to, you, I, I just, I just stayed at, at, at Upper House in Hong Kong, which is a gorgeous hotel. And I've been there before and it's, and thank God I, I understood it. But when you walk into the room, the, uh, the concierge needs to show you where everything is because some things are so beautifully detailed, you can't find them. Uh -huh. And so, so that's, that's, it's a criticism actually, you know, because, uh, it's, it's not, while it's a delight to interact with these things, it's uh, it can be disorienting and confusing, especially if you're only there for a night or two. So we don't want any guest to ever have to learn how to use a space. And the same rule applies to how we design our residential work now. We want things to be intuitive and seamless, but we also want them to have a sense. I always try to work with a balance of grandeur and intimacy in our spaces. And I can talk more about that if you'd like, but but we 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 started off being asked to design homes like hotels but i think i think it's sort of implied now mm -hmm. uh, at this point they, they kind of know our clients seem to know what they're getting in both directions That's if that answers your question. yeah it does that's why they come to you in the first place <laughs> what you were just saying also really coincides with your definition of luxury which i really like in your dental manifestos which i want to link to in this article, you define luxury as the removal of obstruction between the user and the desired need. So what are some specific ways that philosophy translates into your interiors? What does this look like in practice? It, we, it's, it's a good question. They're, they're oftentimes they're really simple, almost stupid moves that you, that anybody could do, but they don't just, they just don't happen very often. For example, making sure that the nightstand is approximately the same height as the top of the mattress so that while you're lying in bed and fumbling for your phone you don't have to reach too too far down or too high up to get to it so something it's some, sometimes it's as simple as that other times it's making sure that the path of travel is simple and linear and quick for let's say getting from the bedroom to the toilet in the middle of the night or things like that that are just I, it doesn't sound luxurious when you phrase it that way but but the our goal is to make living graceful and ele and effortless. Mm -hmm. So the the fewer obstructions we can have to to point A to B or whatever function it is that needs to occur, that's that's um that is that's part of our goal. And then we embellish. So if we if we have a very clear linear route from uh, a gallery to a bedroom, we might we might have uh, a moment where there are two niches on. We did this recently where there where there's a niche on either side of the main doors to the bedroom, and there's an announcement with pedestals that have uplit vases and a bit more grandeur. So it's in your periphery, but it's not it's not an obstruction in any way. It just kind of glorifies the the normal interactions through space. That uh, also a good segue. So you mentioned you have a real penchant for architectural history. And I'm wondering how that passion for classical life has influenced your more modern and contemporary spaces. Uh, thank you. That's a that's a great question. So, so I grew up uh, as, as an Orthodox Jew, and so we we didn't have we didn't use electricity on the Sabbath, and I couldn't draw, and I couldn't do anything that I that I really used to love. And so, I my 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 therapy basically during those that those 25 hours was either Legos or reading through tomes of classical architecture and studying their floor plans. So I obsessed over that at an early age through college. And then I moved to Rome and I was a private guide in the Vatican for Jews and put a lot of those, a lot of things that I had seen and learned and memorized to, to life. And what I, what I really loved about 
being the Vatican specifically, are there there are these tremendous details to to, to a T or, or or overboard. Uh, but then there are then there are niches for every for every window, for example, there's probably a three foot deep niche with a step up and side benches, basically. So there's this quiet little moment that you can reflect and have a conversation with another person opposite the window amidst the sea of grandeur in the distance. And that that has really influenced the way that we think about space. We use classical um, classical precepts of procession and balance and symmetry sometimes and compression and expansion and uh, crescendo and de decrescendo to to bring grandeur and intimacy to our spaces and we we also you know we accept modernity of course it's uh, <laughs> it's with us and 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 we we love it and there, there are many things about it that 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 we actually highlight you know we love for example using led coves and things like that that we, we couldn't do in the past but we fit them into a vocabulary of streamline moldings and details that bring a little bit more character to a space than just a wash of a wall and, and, a, and, a, and a being bathed in light. You were using a lot of musical language and to me it mm -hmm. sounds like the uh, classical influences are more in the rhythm of a space than necessarily the aesthetics of it. That's a great observation and I think you're right. We we don't have any specific aesthetic. We, we actually, we deliberately try not to. It, it changes based on the project. We're doing, we're doing a fairly classical project right now, actually several for Bellagio in Las Vegas, for example. And we're also doing contemporary houses. And in both, we try to bring either, we try to bring a little bit of flair from the other direction into it so that they, there always is this, I hate to use the buzzword transitional, but I think it's accurate that there is uh, that, that transitional yeah. element, right? And did, do you think that growing up Orthodox really influenced your attraction to the 20th century modernist approach to tech? Is that where that comes from? That's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I I don't think it has, but I don't I don't love having all the automated buttons, for example, on, on the side of a wall to open the doors and lift the shades. I'd like to interact with things. And I wonder if part of it does come from my experience and knowledge that First of all, we can do it ourselves, and and second of all, that there's something there's something very intimate and very grounding about physically affecting your environment and not just pressing a button and getting annoyed when it doesn't work. <laughs> right. What happens when the tech breaks? So right. Exactly. How, how do you integrate tech into your designs while maintaining that sort of humanistic or natural connection? We, I mean, we accept it. It's a necessary element in daily life. We don't let tech take over. We prefer to have instead of high tech, we like to have high touch. So there is this there's this sense of of much closer interaction with everything. And I love the fact that we're starting to see the turn dial knobs coming back. And that's that's we actually haven't used those yet, but I love that that kind of control over a room. I think that's much more interesting. It, decoratively and in terms of the human experience. I, I look a lot to to early 20th century modernism when it comes to technology. There are several examples. So, okay, my first my first real time to, in Europe was a, a semester abroad over the summertime where they took, we studied modernism in Central and Western Europe over the course of eight weeks. And we were eight different countries and it was, it was tremendous. And I was suddenly seeing all these palaces that I had loved forever, but also seeing Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier and all these beautiful museum buildings and understanding what that kind of detailing and that sort of modernism meant. And that in itself is impressive. And they, that modernism is about exposure to daylight, exposure to fresh air, it, just keeping buildings, kind. It, it's sanitation, actually, right? Like modern hospital thinking, bringing that into daily life, which doesn't sound so elegant, but it was revolutionary at the time. And it's what helps us feel, feel healthy. And, and now that we're living in these hermetically sealed boxes with air conditioning, it, it, which is important, of course, I, I think that we need to get back to a little bit to to that sense of exposure. I love that in France, for example, people have their dinners in 20 degrees outside with their fur coats and they're smoking their cigarettes along the street, but they're accepting nature for what it is and not insisting that they're completely heated and insulated and cut off from the outside world. My favorite modernist building, and it's a little bit post almost, is a building by, I think it's Pier Luigi Portolupi is his last name, in Milan. It's called Villa Necchi Campilio. At which which has become very known in the, in the in recent years, but I was there a few years back, a couple of times actually, and, and their approach to modernity is really interesting because they still have traditional detailing. It's all mahogany interiors, and there's some 
there, there are some modern touches to it. Yeah, I'm sort of actually kind of fascist architecture, which I, I happen to adore. Uh, chic, yeah. <laughs> because that it is it is chic, and it that also, by the way, is that sort of transitional, right? That's traditional with modernity, and they're they're taking major motifs and blowing them out of proportion, and then it's really playful and interesting and still clean. So this this house had things like French windows overlooking the garden in their dining room that pocket into the wall. So when you want the fresh air, it's literally a cut in the wall that's perfectly finished. Mm -hmm. And and you do it by hand. There's no motor behind it. And it, it it's that kind of modernity that I love the most, these exquisitely detailed interactive connections between you and the building and 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 you and uh, you and the outside world. When I think of the place where I feel least connected to nature, I think of Las Vegas. <laughs> so <laughs> how did you bring in that philosophy when you were designing there? Wow, Specifically that's the a hotel great, spaces. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, for this, I have to give full credit to, to Steve Wynn and Roger Thomas and to Ryder Butler, because when we were designing wind spaces, it started with a vision 30 years ago, 50 years ago. The idea was in casinos, in order for them to be successful, you have to, it has to be dark, it's no clocks, low ceilings, no daylight. Let people forget where they are, trap them, and keep them playing. And the wind's approach, and it started it started with Bellagio in a, in a way, but, but wind really, I think, knocked it out of the park, was bringing skylights, windows, gardens, flowers, water, all these things that make people feel naturally safe and comfortable in kind of almost a primordial sense. In the high rise in the tower, okay, you've got a giant window and you can't operate it and that's that is what you have. But on in the in the main casino space, it was revolutionary that it felt like you could feel daylight. You could sense the world changing around you, but it was it was rich and luxurious and elevated and enlivening. And I think people keep on coming back there and chose to stay there as long as they do because it is so enriching in a way at a, at a physical level and an emotional level. So we try to do that too in our current design here. So the projects we're doing for com commercially here in Las Vegas right now are, are entirely remodels. We're, we're sort of landlocked with what we have. We're actually, now that, we, now that I think about it, we're completing a pool deck project at Bellagio tomorrow. And one of the major initiatives of the pool cafe that we, that we changed was to introduce more greenery into the center of the cafe so that there and, and actually more daylight too. There's a there's a glass, there's a glazed dome that is based off of Villa Borghese in Rome. So again, very classical with a slightly contemporary approach to it. But we're trying to bring more daylight and more more natural indicators back into uh into our existence here. Do you have a favorite project or one that you have found particularly rewarding? I love all my children equally. <laughs> but uh but no, which one's your favorite and, today? It's a hard question because we get to constantly reinvent things as we're going. Because we're not just choosing a specific style that we're hired for, it, it's not like anything is routine. Everything is a discovery. And, and what I love also, I have to say, having having my own business now, this studio, even the most intensive, what should be kind of like, like the hardest, crappiest days are still good days. So everything is a pleasure. I, it, it really is. I'm grateful every single day for what we get to do. We are doing interesting projects. We're doing an in addition, and and some tailoring to an existing home by Paul Williams. He was the first African American architect to be recognized by the AIA. He um, the first one to win awards. He he learned to draw, and I think probably to to write upside down because half of his clients wouldn't sit on the same same, same side of the table as him. But he built homes for uh, Frank Sinatra and and Lucille Ball and Julie Lund, who was part of the Rat Pack as well. We're working on a home that was hers. And the, the owners of the home are the second owners that like they just they right after her and they want to lovingly restore part of it and kind of augment a room that should have been done a certain way. And she sort of probably pushed pushed Paul in the wrong direction, we feel. So mm. we want to bring it back to Paul's voice. And also this, this other addition upstairs to the, the, the owner suite that we're doing very sensitively and playing with floor plan again and detailing. So that's been a real pleasure to, to go through the historic drawings, to interpret what, what could have been done, what maybe wanted to have been done and, and dovetail into it with, uh, with sensitivity. Do you have a dream project that you would love to have realized? I think I'm always dreaming. I, I sketch constantly. My sketchbook is with me everywhere I go. So there are always dreams and there are always mini projects too. There's also products that, I, that I'm interested in designing and want to start start giving a voice to. I started designing total environments. And when you also draw in a vacuum, those are, those are similarly total environments. And 
I love the idea of of being able to develop a a full property, a, a full resort property that's based in in a very specific natural environment and playing towards that, seeing what that teaches us in terms of the design, the decor, kind of the way that, for instance, Enamon might do it, right? Is like, I would love to do a project from start to finish, from architecture down to, down to table settings and stationary at that level, mm. eventually. Oh, that's a great answer. So those are all the questions on my end. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you think is super important to get out into the world? I can say for those who are who are thinking about starting their own business, if I had known what was what it would entail on the front end, I probably would never have done it. The first two years was a continual sucker punch of of just new information like how to deal with taxes and all sorts of things that never had to deal with. And, and as a designer, as an architect by training, I'm not a business guy. So there were a lot of learning curves. And thank, thank God I had a very strong network of supporters and resources I could reach out to for, for answers. And I'm not afraid to ask dumb questions. I think that's something that's really important to approach the world with modesty and to know that none of us have all the answers and none of us are always right. So I was able to kind of deal with those first two years and things are things are working. But it's, it's a very interesting journey having your own business, but it's also extremely rewarding. That's awesome. That's a great note to end on. Alex, thank you so much for doing this. I so appreciate thank it. Thank you, Courtney. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye.